everyone. Welcome to SEMA. This is our 10th SEMA in our series. Today we're lucky to have Jason Ringus with us. Uh, Jason is a life researcher and historian. We're very lucky to have Jason here with us. 30 years experience and hands-on, so he's a true expert. Welcome aboard, Jason. Thank you, John, and hello to all the other rifers listening. Now, um, we're hoping to um, twist Jason's arm and have him on several several um, shows. Um, today we're going to focus on Royal Rife, um, his early years, and really focus on the man himself. Many people know about his achievements, his equipment, but not many people realize the background behind that. And uh, just the many, many different interests that uh, Royal Rife had. He wasn't just interested in what we know as rife machines, which are the plasma machines. He, was, um, he had many other interests and hobbies. But um, Jason, I'd like you to explain to the viewers now, um, what, um, what were Royal Rife's interests and hobbies? Well, he had a variety of uh, interests and hobbies. He was a, an expert marksman. He used to go, I think, on hunting expeditions. He was a very talented musician, which some people had uh, said was part of the reason why his keen sense of hearing when he would use the uh, the headphones for tuning the machines um, he was of course interested in uh, racing he held for the longest a very long period of time a powerboat uh, speed record um, he was into astronomy and was working on a telescope that used some of the optical principles of his microscope and um, kind of interesting letter where Dr. Johnson once was kind of telling him to, when he was diverting some attention to uh, the telescope, he was saying something to the effect that the stars will always be there, right? We have other things to do. <laughs> so that's yeah, funny. he, um, he, uh, you know, and that's how also he came to the attention of uh, Mr. Timpkin because he was very good mechanically and with engines. And so he, the, the power boat that he built and raced was, uh, was Mr. Timpkins. Um, yeah, so he was into, uh, into a lot of different things, um, not, just, not just scientific research. Now, Mr. Timpkin, did he finance a lot of Royal Rice early research? Uh, yes, him and uh, his sister, who was uh, Amelia Bridges, because uh, as the story was told that uh, on the production line for making the ball bearings that Timken is known for and the, the, the roller bearings, they were having problems with uh, um, flaws in the steel. And so Reif reportedly designed and built a, an x-ray machine that was on the line. And so it would be x-raying the steel as it went by. And when a flaw was found, then a, an alarm would sound and they'd stop the line, cut that section out and continue on. And so he saved Timken, you know, millions of dollars in production costs. So because of that, they set him up for life as it was. And that's uh, where he, he uh, sort of earned their, their patronage. That's fascinating. I was just wondering, Jason, in that X-ray machine, I wonder what sort of tube they used. Well, you know, back in then, it was the standard, I guess, the, the Coolidge-type uh, X-ray tubes. But there, there isn't a lot of details. It was just a, an anecdote that uh, Henry Siner had mentioned in the 50s when they interviewed him, and uh, he told the story. And he said, you know, they, they, Rife, they set him up for life. And so that's how he was able to, uh, to, to do what he did, because he had the, the, the patronage of some very wealthy people. Yes, and his interest in music and his ability to tell notes. Um, you know, he had very good, um, very good hearing and a uh, good sense of tuning, and that certainly would have been a very um, good skill. You know, in his development of his frequency machines. Yes, okay. yes, and also because the way they worked back then, where you had to, you know, the the regenerative type systems, you had to 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 tune it. You know to a right point to get the thing to go into oscillation. And so, you know, you, you have to be able to hear well. Yes. 
it sounds like Royal Rife didn't really specialise in one thing, but had quite a broad area of expertise because to design a racing boat engine, you need to be you need to know an awful lot about an awful lot of things. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I you know people uh, you know have referred to him as a Renaissance type of man. Uh, you know back then it seems like you know there were there were people that were skilled and uh, and knowledgeable in a very broad variety of fields and when you're in that situation you can do things that other people can't because they don't have the expertise right right mm. do you, why do you think royal rife started working on a medical device what do you think was his personal motive for that well I don't know about his, you know, if he if he had a personal motive, but he said that he gave up his initial training to go into research work because he decided that uh, research was more important. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, he had seen his share of uh, of sickness um, yes. in in family and around. I mean, every everybody is exposed to 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 ill health, and. Uh, some people that have uh, have the drive to to go in that direction. Right. Um, what was his formal training? Yeah, as I said, he he said that his initial training was at was at Johns Hopkins University, and he was studying to be a surgeon. And I wow. think he was going to specialize in eye surgery, because um, he said he said I'm a surgeon, but he said he gave it up to go into research work. But uh, they said that some of the operations that he used to perform on the, the, the experimental animals were, was some of the finest surgical technique that you would ever see. So, uh, you know, he learned a few things. And I'm sure as far as mechanical type stuff, I'm sure he picked up. Uh, his, his father reportedly was a mechanical engineer. So he may, he may have learned some things from his father. Um, he was raised by his aunt because uh, his mother died uh, when he was, I think, eight eight months old, and so yeah. I guess his father couldn't take care of him himself, so he brought him to his uh, sister to take care of him. Gosh, he sounds like a man who's was always thirsty for knowledge. He would observe. Yes, yeah. yes, uh, those types of people, uh, you know, they 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 like to know things. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, um, one thing which our viewers uh, would be um, no doubt very interested in is what the very first Rife machines were like. The I'm thinking more like you know, he's, he does a lot. He's made a lot of things in his mate lifetime, but his treatment machines. What his very first ones were like? The first machine I would describe as very crude. He said he said he worked with the old original loose couplers. And uh, if you, you can see on eBay, I don't know if he was referring to the, the medical induction coils or whether he was re uh, referring to the loose coupler radio receivers, but they're very, you, can, you can buy some, buy vintage ones on eBay. And um, the, the induction coils, it's like a coil within a coil that you slide it in and out to change the setting. And it has a, uh, an interrupter, you know, that's like a buzzer and... Uh, very crude uh, instrument, but all accounts are that he had some initial success, which uh, prompted him to move forward with it. Did the loose coupler introduce a high voltage into a plasma tube? Is that yes? Those uh, those types of machines, I think they I think they call it ferratic current. So it's like a sharp spike, and then it decays. Um, yes. And, and that's possibly why uh, in the lab film, uh, when John Crane was uh, narrating it, he said that the, the, the spikes that you see are the portion that, are, that you know, kill, the, kill the virus or the bacteria. Um, yes. there's, there's still unanswered questions about the actual mechanism, but uh, the, the, the point is that he had enough initial success to keep moving forward. If he didn't, then he would have been stuck. He wouldn't. Have, he wouldn't have been able to proceed. That's right. And the um, what sort of gas tubes did he use at that time? 
uh, the same, th the same type, uh, the, the, that, you know, we make replicas today, the, the Cool Coolidge type X-ray tubes, but he filled it with a gas because he was actually working conceptually like an X-ray machine, you know, where you have the energy driving into the target and producing some sort of ray. Now, he obviously didn't want to produce X-rays, so that's why he added the gas, and he claimed that it acted as a partial directional antenna. Um, whether that's accurate or not uh, is, is a, a question that perhaps needs to be answered, but I think I've, you know, there has been some indication that that is actually correct. Okay. And so with the tubes that are, that are used by him and by people now, do they produce any x-rays? No, no, you can't, you, to, to produce x-rays, you have to have an extremely hard vacuum and very high voltage, neither of which the, uh, the, the, the Rife uh, frequency instruments do. Because the, once you introduce a gas, and then it becomes like a constant voltage, voltage device. Um, yes. I myself, uh, one of the tubes that I had, I measured it uh, once with a neon sign transformer, and it was 270 volts. You're not going to get x-rays with something like that. Okay. And is the gas important, the gas type that's inside the tube? Um, possibly. Because Rife said that, he said they, well, they didn't care about the color of the, of, of the light that the, the tube produced, but he, they, he's, he claimed that helium worked better than the other gases that it, you know, it stood up to the bombardment. Now, helium has the highest ionization potential of all the gases um, and the lowest mass. So it's possible that gas type is important. On the other hand, there are other people that have used different gases that claim to have gotten results as well. So, uh, you know, that's an that, uh, avenue for further research. Um, some... Uh, manufacturers now they're adding a little bit of mercury into the gas to make the gas bright it, well Jason it makes the gas very bright as it ionizes as I'm yeah. sure you're aware no, of that's um, uh, you know if you're if you're looking to uh, to to impress people you know but I I wouldn't do I wouldn't put mercury well with the mercury then you're gonna have more ultraviolet light which is a concern I mean, the, the gases themselves may produce a small amount of ultraviolet light, but if you put mercury in it, well, not only is that going to lower the ionization potential inside the tube, so you're not going to have as strong an electric field, but uh, Rife didn't do that. Why, you know, if we're trying to follow through and trying to replicate what Rife did, why would you want to fundamentally deviate like that? Right. Um, is the glass type important with these tubes? Uh, probably not. It could be because the, one of the tubes that uh, Reif used, uh, you know, it looked like a double bubble tube and it, it's called a Pifford safety tube. And that was made out of leaded glass except for the, the one face part where the target uh, shoots out and that was quartz. So it had a quartz window, but the rest of it was leaded glass. Um, yes. I don't know if, if it's that important. Leaded glass could be, could be an issue uh, in, point, in the direction that you're pointing it, but the other parts might be okay. Um, some people use uh, soda lime glass. Some people use uh, Pyrex. Some people use pure quartz. Uh, there have been some anecdotes of uh, positive results with all those types of glasses. So probably not that big of a deal. I've seen old historical photos of Royal Rife using conical flasks, which is quite a yes. quite a clever yeah. out of the box way of making a flask but, that could be easily um, refilled. But actually I have heard, you know, the ones with the flat bottoms, the uh, the Erlenmeyer flasks, I heard that they don't work too too good because I think the the pulsing of the plasma can uh, can knock the bottom out of it if it's strong enough. 
<laughs> it might be better to keep it uh, to keep it as a as a globe. I understand. And there are some flasks which have got a um, a circular base. Yes. The ones that are for Bunsen burners. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, one of the questions we asked our viewers to ask questions before this video, and one of the questions was a real doozy, and it's going to probably um, take a while answering. But um, this this um, this person asked, why aren't Rife machines popular now, as, or as popular as they could be? Well, anything that's not in the mainstream is is known by less people, obviously. Um, uh, now, why isn't Rife in the mainstream? I, I mean, a variety of reasons, but it has, you know, I don't think it's a, it's a point to be argued. It's been relegated to the status of medical quackery. And so people that are more conservative in their approaches uh, shy away from that type of stuff. Uh, right. But there are more and more people that are at least aware of Rife. You know, maybe not people actively pursuing it and using frequencies and machines and all that, but, you know, more and more people are, 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 are aware of what, uh, what happened. They just don't know really what to do about it. Okay. Uh, um, in my view, it is a shame that more people aren't at least aware of the principles mm -hmm. of frequency application, even if we don't associate that with rife, um, but frequency application, because it's common sense that if you shake something hard enough, something's going to happen. And yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, back back in Rife's day, that's actually part of the reason, I think, that uh, why he pursued that avenue is because electrotherapy was very popular back then, right? There's, there's a electrotherapy machines that are hand cranked that go back to the American Civil War era. So, you know, people like to get zapped once in a while, I guess. I've heard tales of um, people lying across railway tracks, which are electrified, to get treatments mm -hmm. for malaria. I don't know well, how safe it is. You'd have to be pretty sure of the timetables in that time. <laughs> well, in ancient times, they would have them stand on... Uh, on, I can't remember the name of the fish, but uh, the, well, the electric fish, they'd stand on the thing to get shock for pain relief, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, the, the, um, the so-called Baghdad battery, they have uh, speculated that maybe the, uh, the medicine men back then were using the, the ancient batteries to do the same sort of thing as what the electric fish was doing. Gosh. <laughs> yeah. So this... Really, nothing's new, but it's just got to be relearned again, I guess. And and it has been uh, observed, like when people sometimes, uh, uh, when they get struck by lightning, and then they get cured. I think even Doctor Stafford said his wife, his wife got struck by lightning. It hit the tree outside of the bedroom, and then deflected and went in and hit her in the back. And Gosh. I think she had, she may have had cancer at the time. I don't recall the exact details, but. It hit her in back and sent her flying, but I think it cured her. <laughs> yeah. She had a, a, bit of a, a bit of recovery session, recovery time after that. Yeah. yeah. Quite an incident. <laughs> Excuse me. To the to the best of your knowledge, Jason, do you know of any uh, formal institution that is using the principles of Royal Rife? No, I don't know of any. I. I've wondered about that. Like, I'm, I'm sure there's somebody somewhere doing some quiet research. Well, I guess I can't say I'm sure because I don't know, but I would, I would be surprised if there wasn't somebody doing some research. There's, an, there's a mu enough knowledge of it, and there's, there's also um, other types of electrotherapy. Like, there's that, uh, that type in, uh, in Israel where they apply the uh, the parallel electric wires and and expose it to electric fields. So I, I think that there is some research. They probably wouldn't acknowledge Rife on, about, on it, but um, most of this has been grassroots, just individual people trying to research it for themselves. Now, behind you, Jason, I see hmm. two very, very interesting machines. I was wondering if you could explain to people what they are. 
Okay, so this here is a picture of the universal microscope. That was the third microscope that he built. Um, and it was adapted. That was specifically for his own use. It was adapted for every type of microscopy. Okay, I can maybe even move over. And, um, okay, you see the, the angles right there? The, these things, those are the, uh, the, the prisms in there. So the, the, that zigzags the, uh, zigzags the light rays. And what that does is that has the effect of extending the length of the tube without increasing the physical size. Or else you'd have to stand up to look through the eyepieces. So that was his, uh, and so the longer the, uh, the tube length, the, the greater the magnification that you could get. Uh, the other one here, that is the number four microscope, and that was originally intended to uh, be commercially manufactured so that people, could, other researchers could buy it and use it. Um, that, I think, had a maximum magnification of 17,000, whereas this could go up to 31,000, and I think later on they even boosted it even higher. But uh, most of the work that Rife did was between six and 11,000 uh, times magnification, because once you get past that, it's much more difficult to, to handle it, right? Just the, the slightest little movement of the organism, you know, the vertical movement in the puddle on the slide, you know, could throw it out of focus as well. So most, most of their work was done at, you know, six to 11,000 times. Are these microscopes still around? The the number two microscope, I believe, was bought by the late Lynn Kenny. Wasn't it was in pieces. Um, the the number three still exists somewhere, um, not in working operation. The number five, of course, is in the uh, the uh, the London Science Museum, which I've personally seen uh, back in nineteen ninety six. There was a there was a Dutch uh, a Dutch film crew with a, for some science show in Holland, and they came and interviewed us. And then um, uh, Stuart Andrews, who of the uh, the late Stuart Andrews of the UK, had uh, located the microscope. And then we went there, and uh, we all and the the film crew went there as well, and we filmed it. And, and uh, yeah, that's not working either. So n none of the Rife microscopes that still exist. They don't work. That's a shame. Why, why don't they work? Well, I think there's some parts uh, parts missing. Uh, people don't know how to set them up to it. Like, like for instance, was it the number four microscope was went to London back uh, before the war, and uh, it uh, it was uh, jarred during shipment, and they had to do a transatlantic telephone call. And Rife had to guide Henry Siner into realigning the prisms to make to get it to work. Um, I'm sure some parts have been cannibalized or stolen. Uh, you know, you, you have to have an optical expert that that understands what it uh, you know how it how it operates so that he could uh, he could uh, set it up. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so Royal Rife, he. It was an expert marksman. He invented the world's fastest racing boat engine. He designed the world's most powerful microscope, and he invented a way of treating people and curing incurable diseases. <laughs> yes, he was quite a remarkable man. Yeah. In some ways, his um, his interests sort of linked together. His his expertise in mechanics would have been useful when he was making the microscopes and mm -hmm. the microscopes would have been useful for his treatments. Did he use the microscopes in testing his frequency machines? Well, yes, that's the foundation of the, the testing is that he, as he describes as himself, he says, I put, I put a pure culture of the organism under the microscope and then I tune this thing. He says, until I find a frequency that'll destroy it. Then he would zero the machine put a fresh culture, try it again, try it again. He said, if I can do it 10 or 12 consecutive times after the machine has been zeroed, then I can record that. So without them, with, and now you don't have to have a Rife microscope. 
If you're working with bacteria, you can use a conventional, any, you know, regular microscope. Um, but he was, the, the, the basis of the frequency research was his observations under the microscope. Yes. Okay. The frequencies that he found that were effective against certain diseases and microorganisms, he recorded them, did he, on a, in, some, in some notebook? Or yes, yes. He had a lab, uh, lab notebook. Uh, we have copies of, of 27 lab notes. 24 of them have frequencies listed, but there's a little bit of confusion the way that they were recorded. And uh, then when they uh, constructed the later machine and with a little bit better technology, they uh, read the frequencies and they're different. So the, the original measurements of the wavelengths and frequencies of the, of the old machines uh, are probably mistaken. Okay, okay. Would those frequencies that we have now be still effective? Because we're talking, you know, many years, 80 or so years. Yeah, we simply don't know. They might be, they might not be. Uh, the only way you could find that out is if you tested it. Simple, you know. You can take, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, you know, championed the idea for a long time. Just he had a frequency for uh, E. coli bacteria. Anybody can see it with a regular microscope. Test it out. See if it works. If it doesn't. Why doesn't it work? Is it a little bit off or uh, is it completely changed? Uh, we don't know. But testing is the only way to know. Okay. And have people reported back with modern, you know, equipment with the accuracy of today, whether his frequencies do seem to work with their machines? Um, I, we don't know. Uh, there has been some research, uh, nothing conclusive. Um, I have heard, uh, you know, anecdotes of uh, people having successfully destroyed uh, bacteria under the microscope. Um, I would like to see something that's reproducible so that all the rest of us can try it out and see it. Because if you can do it over in China, but I can't do it over here in Canada, well, it doesn't work. It has to be reproducible. Okay. Okay. Well, we've, um, if, you, if you Google the word rife now, you'll get something, you get one or two results back, uh, one or two billion results. Um, so there's a lot of equipment out there at the moment. Um, and, you know, are these machines rife machines? Are they similar to what Royal Rife is using? Well, if somebody tells me that they have a rife machine, my response is prove it. Simple as that. Well, that's why, you know, I've, I've argued the point for many years that the, the, the technology that a machine is constructed with isn't the determining factor of whether it's a rife machine. The determining factor is in the demonstration. If you can't demonstrate your machine to do what rife claimed he could do with his machines, then it isn't properly called a rife machine. Simple as that. I mean, it may be clinically effective. You may be able to get a lot of benefit of it, but it's simply not a rife machine. Right. Um, if a contact machine, for example, Jason, uh, was effective in killing germs and the frequencies that Royal Rife used um, were, you know, were shown to be effective, against the target pathogens. Would that be called a Rife machine? If you could objectively demonstrate that it, as we'll use the term, devitalizes bacteria the way Rife did, then whether it's a plasma tube or a, a contact machine, I don't think anyone today really cares. They just want something that does what Rife claimed you can do. Okay. So I guess what you're saying, Jason, is, is not so important to put a label on something. It's really looking at how effective it is and okay. um, whether it does what it's purported to do. Yeah, it has to produce the results because, you know, people today with all types of machines, even off-the-shelf uh, function generators, and they put some handholds, they get some therapeutic effects. Um, and that's great. But 
It's not the same thing of what we're looking for with a, with a right, so-called Rife machine. Rife described a specific methodology and effect that his machine produced, and a machine has to be able to produce that and demonstrate it objectively the way Rife did. If you can't do that, then, you know, in my opinion, you shouldn't be calling it a Rife machine. I understand, though, I do understand that the manufacturers of machines, you know, calling it Rife, including the, the, the name Rife, but to some degree to the, to the so-called uninitiated, that creates confusion. Because just like when I first started in this field, I read Barry Lyne's book and I read about the Rife machine and that it could do this and that, and I wanted to buy a Rife machine, just like everybody else. Then uh, it turned out that I learned that the machines that were on the market at that time uh, weren't the same as what Rife was doing. So I held back. That's it. Did Royal Rife ever try using anything other than a plasma tube for transmitting frequencies? I don't know. I don't know if he, if he uh, you know, because as I said, he was working conceptually on the basis of X-ray. So he was thinking of some sort of ray, and he claimed that the, that the, the, the so-called Rife ray was 17 times more penetrating than X-ray. So why would he say 17 times? I assume that he did some test that demonstrated that it was 17 times more penetrating than X-ray. So that, um, you know, it, we don't, maybe he, he didn't, um, maybe he didn't try other things. Maybe there was patents that needed to be avoided. We don't know. Um, uh, but I think, uh, I think the, the non-contact method uh, has its definite advantages. Yes, um, I read at one time that he had to change the design of his machines because they were broadcasting across radio frequencies. Well, the, the original Rife machines were essentially AM radio transmitters. That's all they were. And but instead of uh, you know, broadcasting from an antenna, they were using the plasma tube. Now... If you look at some of the, 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 the photographs where they have really long leads from the transmitter to the plasma tube, well, those are going to broadcast as well. So in, I think it was 1934 is when the FCC first started and uh, radio was getting uh, more popular and so the, the frequency spectrums had to be controlled. So they would send a guy in a car down the road tuned to the certain frequency and they'd put a tone on it to see how far it would splatter. And, uh, and he said, he said uh, once they, they, that they used to raise the devil with the, with the frequency machine with all the radio receivers that are around. <laughs> you know. I suppose if uh, many households had those sorts of transmitters who would be playing mm -hmm. havoc on the people wanting to listen to the radio station. That's it, because back then there wasn't any television and everybody listened to the radio. So... Um, yeah, that uh, that could be a problem. But couldn't they have used a different type of cable going to the tube, perhaps a shielded cable? Well, I don't know if they had uh, if they had uh, coax back then. I'm sure that with with greater and you know as the technology improved, then I think it's less of a problem. Like I've. Uh, you know, there's there's been some tests of uh, of machines built today where, you know, you walk off the back of the porch and then you can no longer detect the signal. So there is methods of doing it. Back then, it was different because that technology was pretty crude by today's standards. Yes. Um, and I heard of one clinic in Greece that used a radio aerial, a, trans a pure radio transmission to broadcast frequencies, and they were broadcasting around the 100 kilohertz range. They used to change from hotel to hotel to sort of keep away from the authorities. <laughs> but um, in your opinion, would that type of transmission device, that method, work? Disregarding the legalities of it, whether the, whether there be the, um, the strength in the radio signal? 
Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I would have to see some sort of uh, experimental evidence. I mean, it's it's certainly possible that uh, that you know they they came up with a system that that it works. For instance, diathermy machines they work with uh, metallic pads and it's just an electric field. And uh, they you know if you use pulse diathermy, you can get uh, you know all kinds of good results. Uh, if they're doing something similar, you you could get you could get results. Okay. That's amazing. Um, if someone wanted to make their own rife machine, if someone wanted to make like a, if they, they didn't have much money, they didn't want to have to buy a commercial device. And, um, and if, if they called you up, Jason, like how could, what, how would you suggest they make a, a cheap machine? That has got a this that may produce results. A cheap machine? I don't know how. Like I'm not an engineer, um, so you know, as far as designing your own machine, you could follow uh, some of the publicly available information that you know that's modeled after the 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 older type of machines. But as far as you know, you would still have to accumulate all the parts. Would which would still set you back, uh, you know, a fair amount of money. Um, mm. I think, though, people have to do the best they can with what they have to work with, right? If you have yes. just a low-cost little frequency generator, some vintage function generator, you, you know, you do the best you can with what you have. If you're in a position to get something better or to design or build, there's some very, very intelligent people that are, you know, in the so-called Rife community that, you know, can build all kinds of things. Uh, the average person, uh, they, they basically need to buy a machine. Okay. Yeah. Um, or they could go to somebody that has a machine. I mean, there are people that have what they call chat houses, and uh, they have the machine there, and people come over, and they run frequencies. Uh, you know, there's, there's situations like that, but... You know, there are some alternative type, uh, you know, naturopaths, that sort of thing that, that use frequency machines. But if you're treating especially some sort of serious illness, I think it's best that you have a machine of your own. Okay. Um, are there any advantages of, of the uh, Rife method of treating diseases over mainstream medicine? Oh, yeah. Well, because, well, think about it this way. Um, we have antibiotic for bacteria and antifungals, antivirals. But when you're using a chemical against an organism, you're dealing with it on its level because chemistry is its business and it's designed to adapt. So that's why we have the problem with uh, antibiotic-resistant germs. It's because that's what they're designed to do. They adapt to different chemical environments. When you blast it with an electric field or you know some sort of electrical energy, you're taking you're 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 taking it out of its element. It can't adapt to that. And so that I think is the the primary advantage and cost, of course, because if you were able to to use uh, an ele electronic device that uh, could be used for any microorganism, then you wouldn't have to spend all that money on, uh, on antibiotics and antivirals. That makes sense. It makes sense. It's hard to become accustomed to an electric shock. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts. Well, you know. when you're dealing with radio frequency fields, then you don't really feel it there. So, uh, you know, when you're, when you get the, uh, the, the so-called zap, that's when, you know, you're using lower frequencies, which are within the frequency response range of the human nervous system. And that's why you feel them. Once you crank it up beyond that, then you don't feel it. Mm, but the bugs should, hopefully. Well, uh, the bugs, uh, hopefully they do. Yeah. Now, um, when, I was, when I read through historical records of Royal Rife, um, I read how he... Uh, lost a lot of his documentation. Um, if the documentation was lost, that 
um, begs the question, how do we know that we're following his methods if, if we haven't got the records of the earlier years? Well, there is, there is sufficient information that has survived that can guide us in the right direction. Um, and that's, that's how I've generally looked at the, the historical information is that that is just a foundation to, to guide us in the right direction so that we can do new, you know, modern research to reestablish it. And then we won't need to refer to the old information anymore. Um, that, you know, hasn't really happened the way, the way that I would like, but uh, there, is, there is enough information. But um, people haven't really, to, to, you know, with the exception, with few exceptions, people haven't really, you know, followed through on the information that we do have. Okay, so that needs to be done, really. People need to uh, look again, possibly through different eyes, at the information that we have. And Well, the thing is that uh, a lot of people that, uh, that I've you know, dealt with over the years, it seems like they're more, more interested in promoting their, their own pet ideas and philosophies uh, and mindsets and then sort of riding it on top of the subject of rife. Whereas, you know, uh, it actually has nothing to do with Rife. <laughs> yeah. So you've been researching and um, studying Rife, Royal Rife's life and his equipment for 30 odd years. Um, now, now you made me feel old. Well, you don't actually look 30, but um, <laughs> we'll let our viewers decide. But what I was going to ask was, you know, have you found... What were the obstacles you found whilst you're doing your research? Was it was it smooth sailing, or did you find that there no. sometimes? Especially like you know, I, I probably not. So to some degree, it still exists, but there was a you know, some people were were secretive, um, like even John Crane. Uh, you know, the, there was stuff that he held back. I don't believe that he understood as much as he he let on. Um, but, uh, you know, we tried to accumulate, you know, as much information we, we could and put it out there so that others can take it and run with it. Because as far as obstacles to, to moving the Rife research forward, it's a question of resources, uh, expertise. I mean, we need professionals involved in this, not just amateurs like myself and others, because the professionals are the ones that have the resources and expertise to to take this full circle. Um, and, you know, to, to, to a large degree, I would also say that we, the Rife community, are an obstacle to moving this forward because we, uh, you know, we're just, uh, as my old shop teacher used to say, we're just hacking and hoping. You know, we're arguing about all kinds of irrelevant details and nobody is, you know, picking up on it and following through the way Rife described. Everybody's trying to change, change the narrative and give different definitions to, to, to things that are clearly defined. And uh, when you have that situation, then it uh, muddies the water. You know, whereas we need, we need clarity so that we can have more credibility to present it to professionals who could take it and run with it and take it to the finale. A researcher at the moment, um, Anthony Holland, he's doing uh, just that, I believe. He's doing solid research to try and find, well, he's, you know, uh, killing cancer one cell at a time, he puts it. Um, he's got the energy, which I think is required to um, hopefully change mainstream. And he's had some very positive results. Well, I, I certainly hope uh, Anthony succeeds and wish him all the best, but killing cancer cells isn't the same thing of what Rife was doing. Rife wasn't targeting cancer cells. He was targeting what he called a virus, a specific microorganism that he found in a tumor that he believed was the cause of the tumor. So that's fundamentally different. Um, you know, and so you have to be very careful. And killing cancer cells in a petri dish—that's some specific cell line. 
that's a long way away from actually curing cancer as it exists in a human patient. Mm. Yeah. But it's a start, and uh, you know, I encourage everybody who's involved in research to press forward. Mm. I was interested to find that Anthony Holland was also, is also a professor, professor of music, so he, he shares yeah. that a similar background to Royal Rive. He's got that. that well, uh, it certainly doesn't hurt. Absolutely. Um, I did have a, a, a criticism of, uh, of Anthony. Uh, he did a, a spectrum analysis video of the, the frequency machine that he was using. And um, that actually was the, the impetus for me to study uh, FFT spectrum analysis and to, to look deeper into that and uh, his conclusions are completely wrong on that video and um, I, I pointed it out to him but you know some people they're 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 moving forward at such a pace that they can't stop and turn back and revisit things um, so you have to be very careful when you do research of this nature because now they referenced his spectrum analysis video in one of the, the, the papers that he collaborated on, but you know that video that he did with the spectrum analysis, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it only shows us what not to do. I mean, the conclusions are totally incorrect. Um, so caution, caution is warranted. And uh, when you're taking measurements of that nature that, you know, and... Uh, and coming to to certain conclusions that have important implications, you have to you have to be careful with that. Okay, but he has been having some success, and one thing I do admire Anthony for is pulling people together. At yeah. the moment, the Rife community, in my mind, seems to be quite disjointed with arguments and this group and that group, and there's no collective uh, yeah. movement. and And really, to make to make life more acceptable in mainstream medicine we really need to group together and work as a force rather than a disjointed group absolutely of yeah see because i haven't been part of the forums for for quite a long time so i'm not i haven't been following uh, i've heard from others that uh, that uh, there there isn't much really going on uh, uh, but uh, yeah, if Anthony Holland can uh, can get people together and get some resources together and conduct some serious research, I'm all for it. Absolutely. Mm. And he's definitely a man of energy because he's been doing, he's been doing it for a lot, quite a few years, <laughs> yes. and he never 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 stops. He just keeps on going. Yeah. Like the Energizer Rabbit, I guess. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the Royal Rife. Um, I'm struggling to um, like. There's so much that he was good at. Was there anything that he wasn't good at? Like, was, did he, was there anything which he struggled with? Um, he had a few quirks in the pronunciation of words. Like, uh, for instance, instead of saying inoculate, he would say inoculate. Um, instead no, he's not of related saying, to George, <laughs> George in, Bush's. <laughs> no, instead of saying uh, uh, primordial, he would say premoidal, so uh, that's some some interesting quirks in his speech. But the thing the thing about you know, okay, we we accept we understand he was a genius, very talented and very. But he was a man just like everyone else, and he was fallible. He wasn't perfect. It's highly unlikely that everything he did was successful, right? We don't want to deify him that he was infallible. So. Um, yeah, he was just a man, just like everybody else. Well, there's, well the only flaw being some of his words, the way he pronounced them. <laughs> I wish uh, that was more than I, I actually, because, and, he, and here's the thing, because John Crane, when he transcribed the audio interviews with Rife, because he was listening and he didn't understand uh, what Rife meant, and so he, uh, he wrote down premodal, Premodal, uh, you know, that as uh, as a transcription instead of uh, understanding that he was meaning primordial. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, imagine if he had, you know, a dictation software. If he was using a yeah. dictation software, we're yeah. stopping it, stopping it many yeah. words. <laughs> now, um, in in Rife's lifetime, in his early years, he was having success. He was having measurable success, and he could see that success and prove it with his microscopes. So, the million dollar question: Well, it's more than a million dollars. Why wasn't this? used it wasn't it accepted by mainstream medicine why aren't we why aren't hospitals and doctors using it now why isn't um doctor clinics why don't they have a rife machine in the corner to fire up and give someone a quarter hour treatment well uh, well i think it's that's a very complex issue it's like you know sometimes in the rife community we get caught up in conspiracy theories that it was just you know, a conspiracy, you know, by the pharmaceutical interests and the AMA and that sort of thing. But I think there's more to the story. Rife, he didn't very, uh, publish very much, right? He published that one paper that I'm aware of with Dr. Kendall, um, but he didn't publish a lot of his, uh, you know, he should have published his research every step of the way. They didn't have uh, the advantage of his microscope at the time. So they couldn't, uh, they couldn't, uh, you have to have independent replication. Um, so those are a couple of reasons. Um, Rife himself, he says, uh, he said, you know, I completed this research uh, and uh, handed it to them on a silver platter. They don't want it, right? And uh, I think that's very naive. I mean, you, that's not the way the scientific establishment operates. Right? You're not going to single-handed. If you think that you're going to single-handedly hand the cure for cancer to the medical establishment on a silver platter, I mean, you should go back to bed because you're dreaming. It's not going to happen. You have to publish every step of the way, and they have to independently replicate it. They have to understand what it is. I mean, there's an expression that says doctors are down on things they're not up on. So if you're talking about a radio frequency type of uh, uh, device and they're used to prescribing pharmaceutical drugs, well, that's completely out of their element. So they, they would have to get training on that sort of thing. But you're not going to get training if there's not published papers that, uh, that explain all the, uh, the, the scientific principles and show the evidence as well. So I think those issues, and aside of all the other greed and corruption and infighting, all the stuff that most people have heard of. I think it's a combination of all those factors that it just slips through the cracks. Mm. I think it's quite expensive to, um, to get machines approved by the current medical oh, system. Yeah, now? Now? Oh, it cost a fortune. Mm. Yeah, and that's why pharmaceutical drugs cost so much and only the large pharmaceutical industries and you know even companies that produce physical therapy devices you have these big corporations that have the resources and the finances to uh, to, to get it through the approval process so that uh, and then they can recoup their costs but if you have some small company that's making a frequency instrument you know, the, how are they going to go about that? I don't think that it's, uh, that it's feasible for that. Now, I believe uh, Royal Rife did collaborate with a few uh, medical doctors and researchers in this time. I, I guess maybe that was what he was hoping to get um, acceptance by the uh, mainstream medical system if he, if he did this. And he worked with a gentleman with Kendall. Um, was it, he was a Dr. Kendall, I believe. Um, did he, um, did any of their research, their development, um, pass on to mainstream use now? I don't believe so. Uh, the, the techniques that they used back then, like they used uh, what are called Birkfeld uh, filters to filter out the, uh, the, the, the so-called filterable forms of the bacteria. Nowadays, they have... Uh, they have more sophisticated filters and techniques uh, that, that they use. So, so I think largely that kind of, um, uh, those kinds of techniques are obsolete. Now, however, I don't know about Kendall's medium. 
because that is a critical factor in culturing the, the so-called filterable forms. And um, I remember I went to a symposium back in, I think, 2007. Was it? No. No, it might have been earlier. But anyway, um, went to a symposium and I photocopied uh, Kendall's paper that uh, talked about the medium and I handed it out to a few people. I don't know if they ever if they ever uh, made made any and uh, used it, but uh, you have to, okay, you can use modern filters to, to filter it out and, you know, modern incubators, all the modern technology, but the food that you're growing it on, if there's a, like a, a, a certain need to, to get them to shift into the so-called filterable forms, then uh, you have to go back and follow through on whatever they were doing. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, well, we're getting close to our session, so I'll just see whether we've covered all the questions. Um, this um, viewer has asked, uh, when did uh, John Crane join, um, uh, start working with Rife? Do you know what um, year he started? It was in 1950 that he first came in contact with Rife because Rife was selling... I think a silver plated drafting set it was like a really beautiful drafting set. And I think he had it on display in some, uh, some shop and uh, Crane wanted it. So he got in contact with Rife and, you know, heard Rife's story and he decided he was going to, uh, he's going to follow through and try and uh, resurrect it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, another person has, is interested in the later years of Royal Rife. He was very productive when he was uh, younger. He made his equipment. He did his um, tests and came up with results. But um, and he lived to uh, in his 70s. But um, what, what happened to him in, his, in the later years? Well, he, uh, he closed his laboratory down in 1946 because uh, his eyes actually got damaged, uh, you know, his eyesight, uh, you know, spending so much time at the microscope, his, his vision uh, started failing. And um, so he, he couldn't really do any work. And then he, he kind of gave, gave it up. And then in, in 1946, retired. And so he, um, he lived out his retirement, uh, didn't do a whole lot. He still, I believe, right to to pretty much his death, uh, uh, he was uh, he was an alcoholic. Um, you know, we, we know that that the the strain and the stress and strain of the the court trial in 1939. You know, he was advised to 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 use a little bit of uh, alcohol to calm his nerves, but that turned into full blown alcoholism, and I believe that he carried that problem right to the end. So, what can you do? Okay, well, we've touched on the court case, but we haven't explained to people what the court case was about. <laughs> um, why, why was he going to court? Well, once they had developed the technology sufficiently and he felt that, well, it wasn't actually him. It, he was approached with the idea of uh, putting it into production. And he stipulated some conditions and they formed a, a corporation. They actually... To, to expedite matters, they um, renamed an existing corporation. And so they brought in, I believe they brought in some, some baggage with that existing corporation that ended up being a problem. And so as, uh, you know, they, they were producing some machines, they, were, uh, they were, were bringing a little bit of revenue in, uh, but then there was some shady business going on with the sale of shares and um, that ultimately uh, caused conflict. There was also some issues with not providing the British that they had a contract with uh, the information that was agreed upon. Um, and there's also claims that some outsiders tried to buy into the corporation uh, which was not allowed at the time uh, because it was a closed corporation. So I think there was some weird things going on from, from a few different angles. And then 
Philip Hoyle, Hoyland felt that for his uh, for his best interests that he had to to bring the matter to court so that he could uh, he could uh, protect his own interests and uh, that ultimately bankrupted the corporation. Um, the lawyer for for the Beam Race Corporation claimed he said we couldn't sell these machines so that they would stay sold. So there may have been some uh, some uh, some uh, reliability issues with them. Um, there are some some claims that uh, that some of the doctors that were using them were threatened by the medical uh, authorities in the establishment. Um, so that you know was the ruination. And then, of course, in 1939, uh, the war started out. So. That was uh, that would put a big damper on things as well. So all those things together um, d destroyed the company, and there there was no by by the time the war was over, uh, you know, Rifewoods uh, was retired, and that was the end of the matter. During the court case, um, the stress of the court case turned Royal Rife to alcohol. Did he have any friends around him to support him at that time? Um, he did, and I think, you know, there, there was efforts. Uh, I'll tell you one thing. I heard Dr. Gross, uh, he said uh, they despised John Crane, and he claimed that John Crane sort of fa facilitated Rife's continued alcoholism. I don't know if that's true or not, uh, what, the, what the details are, um, but apparently... A lot of the people that knew Rife in the earlier days, they despised John Crane. Um, so you know, take that for what it's worth. It's very sad. It could have the story could have had a much better ending. Uh, I can think of several, you know, several ways that um, it could have been much better. But for a man that's achieved so much to, um, to you know, become an alcoholic and, and die, you know, without. Yes, but but uh, sometimes these genius types, uh, inventors, uh, sometimes they're their own worst enemy. I mean, you know, we always sing Rife's praises that he did this and he was a great man, which are all true, but he had his faults as well. And, uh, you know, I think in some ways he was a little naive. I think sometimes people that are gifted in one area are deficient in other areas. Um, like I've touched on before, I think that he should have approached his research differently and he should have published more so that, you know, every step of the way he's, um, he's bringing it forward. He should have perhaps concentrated harder on uh, getting the microscope uh, into production. Maybe he could have sold the patent to a microscope company and they could have put it into production. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of things that Rife could have done and maybe should have done that he didn't do. Um, for instance, uh, there's one letter where Dr. Johnson is kind of scolding him like, a, like he was a child because he would uh, take uh, unopened letters that were sent to him and throw them in the garbage. And Dr. <laughs> Johnson said, you can't do that. You, you, and he said, I think something, you're all grown up now. And he said, uh, appoint Mrs. Rife as your secretary to open all your mail and, or, you know, prioritize it, that sort of thing. So, like I said, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, these, these uh, genius types, they kind of sabotage themselves in some ways. It could be also, Jason, he just didn't have the time because he's developing microscopes and frequency treatment devices and, and, and everything. And, and, and um, well, that, that, yes, yes, absolutely. That too, um, you know, and uh, yeah, he was obviously a very busy man. So he, you know, he had, he had uh, constraints on his time. Um, like I said, there's so many, you know, because when we talk about Rife, you know, if you read Barry Lyons book and everything's nice and tidy and orderly, like it's a, you know, uncut and dry situation, but uh, there, there's, there's, far more facets to it and it's more complex than, you know, it's not as tidy as we would like it to be. And there are still many, many unanswered questions. Uh, some we may never know, but uh, as far as the technology itself, we, we understand what his methodology was. 
we have modern technology that can do as much or better. I mean, we're sitting here over 80 years later and we're looking back to the original frequency machines as the gold standard. I mean, if you analogize that to the Model T Ford automobile, does any auto enthusiast look at the Model T as the pinnacle of automotive technology, right? You know, you had a crude frequency instrument that did so much and 80 years later, we still haven't, you know, at least we still haven't been able to prove it that we can do the same thing. So uh, that's why uh, research, uh, research is where it's at. Well, this is leading to more questions again, Jason, um, but we've run out of time. Uh, the things I'd like to ask you are more like technical things, um, precisely leading on from what you've just said now, um, how they ignited the tube and how they drove the gas, uh, the gas tubes. Mm -hmm. um, this this um, session was more Royal Rife than life, and so it's really um, it's really sad, you know, when you hear the fate of Royal Rife and, and really what his legacy is now and, and what we're doing with it. Where um, I think um, if if people can learn to share their knowledge and to work together um, and try and possibly disregard a lot of the theories that it is floating around and focus on the facts. And, well, uh, yes, and and to you know we we have to differentiate between any hypotheses that we might have, uh, any personal ideas, any personal philosophies, uh, and what Rife was doing. I mean, we have to just simply make the differentiation because, as, uh, as I've pointed out elsewhere, that Rife's name and legacy has accumulated all this baggage that has nothing to do with Rife. And that also diminishes the credibility of what Rife was doing, but it's not, it has nothing to do with, with, with anything that he did. It's just all the, 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 uh, the uh, extraneous uh, things that have been added to it. So um, the, it's not beyond the reach. If Rife was able to do it with the technology that he had at the time, then we should be able to do it today and even better. Um, we just have to have to get moving on it and uh, and move forward. Well, you've heard it from the man. <laughs> yeah. That's what we have to do. Thank you so much, Jason, for coming on. Okay. I've really enjoyed our talk, yeah. and I've yeah. learned I've learned a lot. I'm sure our viewers have as well. It's yeah. um, it's refreshing to hear your perspective, and um, you've spent 30 years doing your research. You obviously know know a lot of things that are relating to life. And I'm hoping to twist your arm to get you on, hopefully, next week, viewers. It may be on a different day next week um, because okay. I'll, be, I'll be in a different country. But um, thank you very much for watching, and um, I'll see you on the next episode of SAMA. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.